Great, thanks. Um, so the CTAM project at the University has developed a research and development project with Manesto to investigate cetacean response to an operational parakeet. This project was part funded by the European Regional Development Fund issued by the Welsh Government, part funded by Bangor University with investment from Manesto and the Sinama Research Unit was consulted for guidance and expertise. Um, so the study site is based in the north of Wales in the UK, and the body of water known as the Holly And um, that's approximately seven kilometres from shore and is about 85 metres in depth. It experiences mean peak current flows of 1.5 to 2 metres per second. And it is here that Manesco has commissioned the DG500, which is the first utility scale power type. It has a rated power of 500 kilowatts and a 12 meter wingspan, and they successfully conducted offshore commissioning and testing in 2018 and 2019. They've been awarded further funds for the next phases of development, which include installing an additional system, increasing capacity, and planning for an 18 megawatt array. We also have a number of cetaceans that use the area, and we're primarily interested in the bottom of dolphin and harbour porpoise, for which there are a number of special areas of conservation dedicated to the species, either within or nearby the development zone. The bottom of dolphin is a semi-resident population with a known home range of at least from Cardigan Bay and the southern Bay in Wales up to the Isle of Man. And current abundance estimates suggest there's a population size of two to three hundred individuals. Um, so we expect the encounter rates are quite low for the area, but the low population count um, does mean that they are potentially vulnerable to population level effects. So harbour porpoise is the most common species in the area, and current abundance estimates estimate 15,000 animals for the Celtic and Irish Sea, and local density estimates of one um, animal per square kilometre. Um, but we have no site specific encounter rates for the Hollyhead Deep in particular. Uh, records show that there are also occasional encounters with common dolphin, recent dolphin, and minky rail in the Hollyhead Deep. So there were a number of um, incentives to build this project. Um, the DG500 marine license had a condition to monitor potential collision risk between cetaceans and the kite during operation. We still have fairly limited knowledge of collision risk with tidal stream technology. We have no knowledge of underwater behavior around tidal kite or an established system to monitor a tidal kite. And to our knowledge, there are no published studies of dolphin response around tidal technology. So using passive acoustics to track situations around tidal turbines has been done before. Um, we heard from Doug earlier who currently working on the Mayjang project to track the ocean, and we also um, worked on the Delta Stream project on Ramsey Sound. And the concept is that multiple hydrophones are arranged in arrays, and they detect cetaceans as they produce echolocation clicks. And as an animal moves through an area, a difference between the time of arrival of clicks on those hydrophones allows us to calculate animal position and track their movements in 2D. So with that in mind, the project objectives were to use a similar approach to develop a customized passive acoustic array that would localize the patient localization around the magnetic kite and to investigate dolphin and harbor porpoise movement around the kite to assess the potential collision risk. The kite is tethered to the seabed and the current flow lifts it so that it flies in a figure of eight at several times the current speed. And here is just a a uh, top-down schematic of that tight site. And we're interested in um, whether animals swim into that area covering the flight path. So for this study, we were focused on monitoring the ebb tide, and we wanted to install three clusters of four hydrophones, or we call them four channels sometimes, um, directly underneath the predominant flight path of the kite so that we could track echolocation for clip chains on the ebb tide. So each four-channel cluster would allow us to calculate a bearing, and where those two bearings would cross would give us an animal's position. 
We also wanted to install a single channel array so that we could monitor detections on the NIST scale. We had a number of trade-offs to consider when designing the project. We had no power from the kite or from shore, so we were going to have to rely on batteries. And we also had no real-time data feed or data offload system, so we were data storage limited as well. This means that we'd have no choice but to have a high turnover of deployment. And in terms of budget and feasibility, that means we needed a small vessel and subsequently small mooring. So for the multi-channel array or the clusters, we used swimming point recorders that were built by Desert Star Systems. These are advertised at 56 to 71 day endurance. They have an internal battery pack and four terabytes of SD card storage. We chose to continuously sample at 312 kilohertz. They had a built-in GPS clock and we produced lab files. Um, there were a number of customizations to the instrument made specifically for our project. The hydrophones were moved external to the recorder and arranged in a 15 centimeter tetrahedral array. Harness cables were produced and they would connect four recorders together. And one recorder was configured as a master and would send recording instructions to the others. And it would also provide a single clock for all connected recorders. For the single channel array, we used off the shelf sound traps and we set those at a 50% GT cycle by one device that had a larger storage capacity. Something at 96 kilohertz with the high frequency clip detector turned on and an external battery pack attached. Our field plan was to conduct a one day sea trial um, to test the cluster functionality and then deploy the two clusters prior to kite installation. We wanted to do monthly deployment and recoveries using a local boat charter and we had spare batteries and SD cards so that we could swap out at sea. And we plan for a one to two day, day one to two day turnover of instrumentation. The sound tracks were to be deployed five to eight hundred meters from the ZG five hundred in a configuration so that they would surround the kite but also be a safe enough distance from other instrumentation and mooring lines that were at the site. We used a targeted a thirteen meter mooring service vessel for this job that had a marine crane and a twenty five square meter deck space. We used a gravity-weighted deployment hook to lower the frame to the seabed so we could have a more accurate position and placement of moorings. We used single-point moorings so that they were easier to manage on small vessels and so that there was no risk of entanglement with existing gear on the seabed. And these would be brought back up to the surface using acoustic release. Actually, in practice, when it came to the cloud clusters just prior to the cloud installation, we had access to Manessa's charter vessel, so we, um, the, the array was deployed using a shift in dynamic, dynamic positioning for that one deployment, but that wasn't the plan for the duration of the project. Knowing the precise locations of each charger balloon position from the seabed was crucial for accurate localization. And we had two methods to do this. Um, stage one was using painter trials to determine location of the hydrocarbons on the seabed, as well as the pitch, low, and yaw, and to assess their accuracy. And this was conducted as soon as possible after deployment and again before recovery. And we would send surface like signals and sine waves played with a transducer over the side of the vessel whilst logging GPS position, and the boat would drift over the acoustic array at various distances and bearings, and we would later collect the acoustic data on recovery of the array. We also um, attached the sea tag to our cluster moorings that were also built by Desert Star. They um, contained a magnetometer and an accelerometer, and that would help us determine orientation of the array and also detect any movement of the mooring frame. So some preliminary results. We deployed the multi-channel array of clusters on the 9th of August, 2019, and recovered them on the 21st of September. And we deployed the sound traps on the 27th of August, 2019, and recovered on the 2nd of December. And as we had some issues with frame movement on the large spring tides, some intermittent sync issues within clusters, and some water ingress in some cluster speed recorders due to connector corrosion, which affected the functionality of some channels. However, we did collect data and lots of it. And we collected 31 days, totaling 300 amongst all recorders, and that's excluding the sound traps, which are still to be analyzed. 
Um, and that came to 11 terabytes of data. And we were expecting to generate huge volumes of data. So it was really um, critical that we had IT support from the university, from the ITEC as part of the project planning. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, as Kate mentioned earlier, you generate huge amounts of data. And in that project planning phase, having a, a set of methods to cope with those data volumes is critical. And so each partner held one hard copy, and we had our copy on the cloud. We had lots and lots of hard drives for processing, and a high processor PSPP dedicated to working with this data only. The raw data channels were merged using custom, so custom software, and processing occurred in Tangard. And it took approximately two days to run each cluster. The process data was about 100 gigabytes per cluster. And we detected moderate rates of dolphin. We had bottlenose common dolphin quick trains, or common dolphin quick trains, um, and high rates of recent dolphin quick trains. We also detected harbor purpose, um, but that data is not being processed yet. Here's um, a screen grab from Pangar, and sorry it's a bit fuzzy. Um, but in the top top, we have um, bearing on the Y and um, time on the X. And here is a screen grab of cluster one showing successful bearings of quick trade. Um, and yes, I mentioned bearings on the Y axis. And the colors are manually marked out recent dolphin quick train. And here we've got at least five recent dolphins passing through the area. Here's the same plot again, but in the center in the purple, we have a single harbor port of quick trade. Although we couldn't localize between the clusters, we could check the quick matches between the clusters. And lots of quick matches and minimal clock drift between the clusters is critical for successful localization. So we looked at a random sample of quick trains marked on cluster one and compared them to clicks detected on working channels on cluster two. <clears throat> and we found high percentages of mean quick matches within one second for all species. This suggests that the potential for successful localization when all channels are functioning is high. So in conclusion, a compact plan system and methodology has been developed to monitor stations around the utility scale tidal cap. We've had competing problems, but assessment suggests that the system is fit for purpose. The multi-channel system has now been updated and will be redeployed summer 2020 with mooring modifications. And we experienced moderate dolphin encounter rates with portions to be confirmed. So this gives us a real opportunity to study dolphin response and the potential collision risk. I'd like to thank the funders, co-authors, and the collaborators. Thank you very much. That was great, Gemma. Thank you so much. Um, one quick question.